whatever stage of life that we're in, the fundamentals we're gonna talk about will make a measurable difference for you, but you're gonna have to decide what's right for you. So all I'm trying to tell you is, today, think of this as a second opinion. Think of this as the most important subject of your life, even though you may not have made it that way. Think of it as something that isn't a should, but a total what? A must to master, because if you master this, everything else you can dream of is available to you. And if you fail to master this, everything else goes to the wayside. I mean, I meet people all the time in relationships, and they want relationship therapy, and I, I say, you know what you gotta do? You gotta exercise, you gotta work out, you gotta lose some weight. You guys are just so tired, there couldn't possibly be any passion. When you're exhausted, there is no passion. And people say, okay, well, I'm gonna really work on a plan, and I'm gonna organize things, and I'm gonna find the best trainer, and you know, I come back, and I'm talking to them a week later, and they're still planning things. This woman's telling me, no, but I'm gonna get the best trainer. I got the very best trainer to organize this. I said, ma'am, with all due respect, you don't need a plan, you need a trainer, you need somebody who gets behind you and just yells, run! <laughs> Move! You don't need this long plan. You just gotta move. You know, we're living in a society where nobody moves anymore. What do we like today? A lot of people get injured today. They don't get injured smashing into people playing football and anything else. They get injured typing, right? You know, picking up a pencil. Oh, oh, that really, oh. That's how people get hurt today because we don't use everything anymore. We live in a box. Think about it. Think about our lives today and how different it is than maybe the way we were formed and made to run to hunt, to create, to procreate, to raise our children, to move, to farm, to do all the things that made us use all of our body. Today, what do we do? You wake up and you have this box life. You have a box breakfast, right? You get in your box car, you drive to your box office, you load up a box elevator, you don't use the stairs, of course, right? You go to your box office where you type on a box, talk on a box, right? Go into a box room for meetings, Right? Sure enough, got a little box you can type on, listen to, listen to music on, box. Have your box lunch, drive your box home, or get in the train or subway, and another box home. Get home to your box, and then turn on the box. <laughs> type on a box, message on a box. I mean, and maybe go get a cylinder to change your state. <laughs> right? <You> know, maybe. <laughs> And most people's idea of exercise in our society today is fill the tub, pull the plug, and fight the current. <laughs> you know that, that's the world we live in today. And so it's not hard to figure out why we're getting fat and why we're finally kind of tired and why we're building up acid in our system, consuming foods that have nothing alive in them anymore, where everything is denurtured and everything is chemicalized or radiated. So it, it can feel overwhelming. But I think if we got back to our common sense and if we were really committed, we could make it all work. And what I'm trying to say to you is really simply this this morning. I'm gonna take the morning and not talk to you about how to do this. We're gonna figure out why to. Because 80% of success in anything is psychology and 20% is mechanics. It's the beliefs you have that are guiding your decisions. Listen, if you make a different decision, will you take different actions, yes or no? Yes. If you take different actions, will you get different results, yes or no? So this day is about some new decisions. Some decisions about what you're gonna believe about health and energy, how important it's gonna be from you from now on. What's gonna be a must for you versus a should for you? Energy is a place that I've more than been, right? And I wanna make sure that you have even more. I wanna make it so that it's as effortless as possible in the future, so you're not burnt out from it, so this becomes a sustainable experience. How do you make it sustainable? Create the base. How do you make it sustainable? Challenge it. Once you've got a base, you challenge and grow. How do you do it? Then you gotta celebrate and reward yourself for making these great rewards. And that celebration enhances your base because you feel better and stronger and you wanna do even more good things. You wanna eat better, you wanna play better. I mean, when you start working out and you start to get into it, you love it, you love it. And then your base gets even stronger so you can take on a bigger challenge in life. And sure enough, you reward yourself and celebrate some more. And it becomes how the rich get richer, how the happy get happier, how the healthy get healthier, and the poor get poorer, and the depressed get more depressed, and the unhealthy get more unhealthy. It's momentum. Today is that process of momentum. My goal is for you today to have more certainty. Certainty that you have the answers that can guide you, and that there will be challenges in your environment. They're gonna be environmental challenges. They're gonna be all kinds of things you'll face, but whatever it is, you can handle it. And I'm hoping that as a result of today, you'll not only make a difference in yourself, but you'll own this so much that you won't have to lecture anybody. They'll come to you and go, oh God, you have so much more energy. You look so much better. You lost this. How'd you do it? And you'll be able to say, let me tell you. 
and you will be a person who's a force for good that'll pass it on to the people. So my goal today is to plant seeds so that you not only get this, but this spreads to other people. Got a sort of five point plan that anyone can follow to get over stress and trauma in their lives. Talk me through it. Well, I think, it, first of all, I want to make one thing clear. The quality of your life is the quality of where you live emotionally. Like we all have a home. Angry people find a way to get angry, even if their life doesn't have anything to be angry about. We can always find it. Sad people find a way to be sad. Caring people find a way to care for other people. So one thing you got to identify is where are you living? What's your home? What's your habit? And then the way to change it is when I was homeless, literally on my own, just getting started, I didn't have the Internet, but I decided I had to go to a library and I had to feed my mind. And I always tell people the first stage is, you know, weeds grow automatically. Uh, one of my teachers taught me, he said, every day stand guard at the door of your mind and feed it something good. Because if your worst enemy puts sugar in your coffee here, you're fine. If your best friend by accident trying to help you put some strychnine, you're dead. So if you feed your mind every day, 30 minutes a day of reading something, hearing something. Second, you've got to strengthen your body. And the reason, Pierce, is fear is physical, right? So is stagnation. So is numbness. So is sadness. Such, so is rage. And when you go in and change your body by an intense workout or a run or even an intense walk and the blood's flowing through you, science has shown it instantly changes your biochemistry. And now your mind and body are working together. Third thing, all these people did in common, if you watch, they found a mission bigger than themselves. Yeah. Something that they wanted to aspire to that was worth more than their pain. And then the fourth thing is you got to find a role model. You know, you heard it with Nick. Um, almost everybody finds a role model that makes it real. I was with uh, Warren Buffett and with Sarah Blakely, the youngest uh, billionaire. We're doing this roundtable about the future. And when you listen to this woman, when women meet her, they don't just love Spanx or product that made her a billionaire. They love this woman because she's a role model of what's possible. Yeah. When you get a role model, it becomes real to you if you get a plan, you get a goal plan, and you take massive action. And the last step, number five, there's always somebody all worse off than you are. I don't care what you've done. So if you can go help somebody worse off, it puts your life in perspective, and it also reminds you life's not about me, it's about we. I always tell people, the secret to a great life, the secret to living, is giving. And there's, when you realize there's something in you still to give, even if you lost your legs, even if you've been through a horrific financial situation, your life can improve, but more importantly, you'll have a meaningful life because your life will contribute to other people. Yes? One of the things I wanted to ask you, like on the first day, is you said, like to my friend over here, you gotta lead your people, you gotta learn enough about the job that you hate and then lead them. And what I wanted to ask you is, well, being sort of on the front lines of things, how do you actually, or what are your ideas on leadership? And you gave some examples today. Like, for example, you sort of come up with a plan, and then you ask the questions. So that's one strategy. That's only one part, yes. I was wondering if you could share maybe a two or three more. Sure, I'd be happy to. My number one belief about leadership is you're a servant. But here's, what I mean, here's what I mean specifically. The word hero, hero, that is in the archetype of like men and you and I, I bet. Is, my, is it true that inside of you, you, want, you really want to be the best, you want to create the best, share the best, do the best? Is that, a, is that a metaphor for you in your life? Absolutely. Yeah, me too. So I think people in this room tend to have that as their metaphor. So all of us at some level, man or woman wants to be a hero. The word hero in its Latin root means servo. Servo means servant. It actually means slave. The hero why they're the hero has become the ultimate servant to something larger than themselves, people and so forth. The person who thinks they're going to lead by demand or by position can only lead for a short period of time. But the person whose idea is serving is, my belief is, if you can find a way to take any group of people and help them to experience their needs at a richer, deeper level than anyone else, then together you guys can get anything done. Anything. Now, it may not work the first time, but together you can get to that point. Because needs are ultimately what we're after. We're not after the vehicle we think we're after. You want a billion dollars, then you get it. I got plenty of clients, and I will tell you, it is not the end game. And so now, then they go after their second billion. Or you think it's getting married, and then you get it, and you find out it's not the end game. There's certain needs that have to be there, and the ultimate needs are growing and giving. Because you only can feel so good filled up by yourself. So my core belief is I got to serve. If I serve, I can lead. Because I believe motive does matter. If my motive is just to get you to do something for me, there's a certain amount of power that I can get to do that if I strategize, if I think, if I feel, and also if it serves a greater good, even if I don't intend it. If the bumblebee goes to try to get the nectar it wants, its selfish goal, I believe there's a higher power that guides it all. And when that bumblebee goes, it doesn't intend to give anything but pollen sticks to its legs. 
as it goes about trying to get what it wants, that's how flowers are created. I really believe that everything has a web of connection. If your intent is to serve yourself, you're still gonna serve something more than yourself and you're gonna get a certain amount of insight. If your intent and your motive is to serve something yourself, but also something more, just your kids, then I believe you get a different level of insight. And because you're serving more of what serves life. It's not just me, it's me and my family. If you're trying to serve a community, I believe you get a different level of insight. If you're trying to serve humanity, you get a different level of insight. I get emotional thinking about it because this is why I do what I do. So when someone stands up, it's not about business, it's not about anything, but about serving them. So I will use abrasive or creative language. I'll use whatever it takes, humor, stupidity, I'll make fun of myself, I'll challenge, I'll do anything to serve. That's why I'm here, I don't need to do this anymore, but I love to see someone free and alive and lit up. So when that's your motive, no matter how people perceive you on the outside, if they're around you long enough, you can't hide what your real motive is. And they'll see it and they'll feel it. Motive does matter. If it's to serve something high, it'll be that. That doesn't mean you don't get served too. And in business, you gotta be served. Or I used to do business and I lose money in the business and everybody else was happy. And it was wonderful except I had no business. So it's you know killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. So I've learned to put that balance in. But that gives me power. That's why time disappears for me. Because I'm not about getting some action done. I'm about the outcome. Question. You know, we, we, uh, we talked about, you know, the economy being real rough going yes. forward. But you've given so much of yourself, and I can see it, and the passion behind these people about teaching these really important business principles, that I'm confident that it's going to be a lot shorter to come out of this recession. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Give me a hand. Now, if you listen to all the people here, they're all searching, so let me give you the answer. Three keys to a breakthrough. Think of the area you want to have a breakthrough in right now. Your body, your money, your relationships, your career, your business, your joy, your happiness, and let's look at what it, your choices are. First element, there are three S's for a breakthrough. First element most people are looking for is they're looking for the right strategy. They're saying, if I could find the right strategy, I could get this result right now, and by the way, my life, I am a life and business strategist. All I do virtually is seek out the world for fine strategies. I find people have been together for 60 years and they don't just love each other, they're intimate, they're passionate, they make love. And I wanna know what do they have different than other people? And I don't think it's luck and I know it's not luck and I figure out what their strategies are. They do things that excite each other. And I find out what those things are and you can put them in anybody's relationship and it's reignited. I find people, I just got done doing a four-year project where I interviewed 50 of the most wealthy human beings on earth, the greatest investors in history. And these are all people that started with nothing and became multi-billionaires. And I interviewed them, put it inside the book, the very best of what I've learned. I learned, I got a PhD from the people that control the world economy, from the Warren Buffetts of the world, from the Ray Dalios of the world. And once I knew what their strategies are, like right now, one of the strategies I put in my book, it's called Money Master the Game, I believe it's in Australia now. I think it's coming. Is it here yet? A few of you have seen here? In this book, I got one of them to actually give me his strategy and this man named Ray Dalio. He's the largest hedge fund in the world. This is a guy that rich people, they have money to give to a hedge fund guy. The big hedge funds are 15 billion. Ray is 160 billion. He's 10 times larger than anyone on earth. You have to have a billion dollar net worth and give him $100 million 10 years ago to even begin investing with him. Now he doesn't care how much money you have, he won't take your money. And I got him to give me the strategy that he has all of his personal money and he's never told it to anyone on earth. And I put it in the book because I convinced him you're not taking anybody's money anyway. So you're not getting, you know, all the money you can ever take, you're taking, you're giving up half your net worth. I'm gonna give this to the average person. Anybody that followed the strategy last year beat the stock market. The stock market in the US was 13.2, it did 15.6. In October last year, his strategy, not mine, I just got it from him. The stock market, the Dow dropped 1,000 points in one month. It dropped 6%, this went up 0.2%. First seven days of this year, the market was down 3%, this is up 1%. Right now, it's up three and a half, the market's up, what, two and a quarter. And, and in the last 75 years, it's made money 85% of the time. Well, imagine, and when it lost, it only lost 1.6%. 
And when it wins, it wins an average of 10%. If you could go to Vegas and win 85% of the time at 10% and only lose 1.6, 15% of the time, how often would you fucking play? <laughs> it's in the book. That strategy, you do once a year, you rebalance it and you're done. That's how powerful it is. And it's only not worked twice, 2008 and in 1932. And in both cases, it did twice as good as everything else, but it did lose money. Now, that's the power of a fucking strategy but getting it from the best on earth, that's what I do. Now to do that, I spent time, energy, money, effort. It didn't interrupt me, I had to pursue it. I had to expect no answers, but I want the answer and I got it. So I know the power of strategies if anybody else does, but I wanna tell you, most of you wanna lose weight, you're looking for the strategy. You want a relationship, you're looking for the strategy. You're looking at business, you want your strategy. All good things. The right strategy, save you years, save you decades. Con convert results in minutes that you would have struggled for forever. So I know the value of strategies, but with all that I just said about strategies, they're not the most important piece to a breakthrough. Because think about it, 70% of the United States is overweight. I don't know the current number in Australia, but it's starting to catch up to the US. Most of the world is catching up to the US. We've polluted everybody else with the same lifestyle. And so guess what? Is it really that hard to be fit and strong? Is it so complex that you'll never understand it? Is that why? Is the strategy complex for fit and strength? To be fit and strong, yes or no? Is it like so unique and special that only the 1% can afford it? No. In fact, don't you have to work your ass off to avoid the information that can make you fit and strong? In fact, today, God forbid, if you wanted to go work out and be trained, how far would I have to leave this building to get to a place where they would train me? How far? There's one right over there, isn't there? And we'd probably drive there, God forbid, we'd actually walk to the place we're gonna work out and shit, right? And oh, by the way, you don't have to do that. Now you can take out your phone or your iPad right now and download 10 books. We live in a world where the strategies are all around you. So strategy may be your problem, often it is, but more often you're missing the number two thing you need, and that is the right story. Because the story you have about your life, or about your business, about the area of your life that's not where you want, the area you're breaking through, your story is what's making you be stuck. What's a story? It's a belief that you tell yourself over and over again, like, I don't know the salt is, I don't know the salt is. And you tell the story so often you believe it. There's a man once said, you tell a lie big enough, loud enough, and long enough, sooner or later people will believe you. Who said that? Hitler. And most of us are Hitler in our own minds. We convince ourselves of challenges. So when a person says, well, you know, these, I've tried, someone who hasn't lost weight, they'll say, I've tried. Come on, what do they say? I tried everything, bullshit. If you tried everything, you'd be fit and strong. Well, I've tried thousands of ways. Thousands, name them. Well, I've tried hundreds, name them. Well, I've tried dozens, name them. Well, I did do these two stupid things that don't work over and over again. Mine was, I'm big boned. I am big boned, but I was 38 pounds heavier with the same bones. So we often say things that are true to back things up. They are true, you're big boned, but that is not why you're fat, right? So the story keeps us from it. If you don't have the relationship you want, what's the story? All the good ones are gone and they're gay and I'm not, or they're not gay and I am. There's a story. The story is there. In fact, write this down. The only thing keeping you from getting what you want, the only thing keeping you from getting what you want is the story you keep telling yourself about why you don't have it. The only thing keeping you from getting what you really want is the story you keep telling yourself about why you don't have it yet. Here's what I say. Divorce your story and marry the truth. Divorce your story and marry the truth. And don't make it one of those divorces where you revisit with your old past belief system again. Divorce it, cut it off, and marry the truth. The truth will set you what? But you got to develop the empowering story because without that. Now, some of you think an empowering story is the one that allows you to be, keep going at what doesn't work. I'm not talking about a story where you cover your ass and explain that you're still gonna achieve what you want someday in the future, because no one can argue with that because the future's not here, but really you're not doing anything to change significant. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say I. So you have gotta find a story that's gonna empower you to act, a story that's gonna get you to find the breakthrough, because otherwise, with a lousy story, you'll never find the strategy or you'll come up with a reason why it's too expensive, you can't get there, you can't access it, or you'll even get the strategy and then half-assed apply it 
just so you can reward your story that says it doesn't work because I tried it. Like, it's all bullshit, it's bullshit, it's bullshit, it's bullshit. Jumping and doing something different in your head. Of course it's not going to work, you're not doing it. It's self-fulfilling. How many follow this? Say, I. So I want you to get, this is the secret. And by the way, I don't want to make it so strategy doesn't matter because it does. Let me give you a quick example. Is there a single guy here? Raise your hand if you're a single guy. Let me just see a quick example. Single guys here. And if you're a single guy, raise your hand. I've got so many good examples here. All right, single guys, single guys. Okay, so how about uh, this gentleman right here? Stand up, sir. Give me a hand. Give me a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, give it up in an Aussie hand. All right, what's your name? What is it? Jesse. Jesse, I'm going to get your microphone. Jesse, I bet you're going to get this because Jesse, he's a good kid. You can feel him. So I think you're going to get the answer. So it'd probably be anticlimactic, but let me just ask you. Jesse, I want you to imagine that you're driving in your car with a girl you're dating. Yeah. And as you're driving, she says to you, Jesse, do you need to stop to pee? And you know you don't. What do you say? Uh, well, I, I don't need to pee. Like, I don't need to pee. <laughs> what a weird thing to ask. I don't need to pee. Now, ladies, how do you feel when you ask the guy, do you need to pee? Do you need to stop to get a drink? And he just goes, no. Ladies, make a sound of how that makes you feel. Make a sound. Go. Oh, come on. Make it loud so he hears it. Go. Do I One need more to time. Ask, do I need to ask if she needs to pee? So. It's a quick study. Here's what you're missing. This is why you're single. <laughs> when a woman asks, do you need to stop for a drink? You need to pee. Women don't really mean what they say. They give you clues and want you to be a detective and uncover what they mean because this proves that you really care. It's quite complex, this shit, but I'm going to educate you right now. <laughs> so when she says, do you need to stop to pee, your response should never be no because you don't have to pee or yes because you have to pee. Your response should always be, honey, do you need to pee? <laughs> And then she'll say, I don't know, because women need to talk to see if they have to pee. They have yeah. to speak and then see if they have to do it. And then what, she'll probably pause and you go, you know, honey, I think we should stop. Don't make her say yes. You just make it happen. Now, ladies, if you did that, give him a little response. So, he's just... so is, this man a young, is this a good young man? Is he yes or no? Yeah. Is he nice? Yeah. Is he sweet? Yeah. Is he kind? Yeah. He just doesn't fucking know that women don't mean what they say. <laughs> So he doesn't have the right strategy, so she's going to be pissed at him. How many guys have ever had a woman suddenly be pissed at you and you're going, I did nothing! Gentlemen, make some noise. Make some noise if it's true. You don't have to do anything. They just get to change states. So what you have to do is read the tea leaves. Now, to be fair, let's give Jesse a big hand. Give him a big hand. Yeah. Let's balance it out. Where is a single lady in here? Single lady, raise your hand. Single women, raise your hand. Oh, come on, there's more single ladies. Single ladies, single ladies, single ladies, single ladies, so many. Single ladies, Yay. so many great choices, so many choices. Okay. All right, give her a hand. What's your name? Where are you from? My name's Liz. I'm from Sydney. It's Liz from Sydney, ladies and gentlemen. No, you didn't hear me. I said it's Liz from Sydney. Let me hear you. Okay, Liz, I'm going to give you a little test. Um, you find a man very attractive. You're very interested in him. You develop the courage to go up to him, start a conversation, and then you say to him, hey, listen, would you like to have lunch maybe next Thursday? And he says, no. Right. <laughs> what does it mean? Um, probably For, honestly, what does it mean? What does your gut say it means? First, he, he says no. He's not interested. He what? He's not interested. He doesn't want to have lunch with he, me. He's not interested. Now, he said no, and then she made up a whole fucking story in her head. <laughs> this is what women do. What else do you tell you? He's not interested. What else do you think? He's probably... He's probably got a girlfriend. Got a girlfriend. Um, 
fucking gay. <laughs> gay. Yeah. Right? Gay girlfriend. What else? He's stupid. He's stupid. Okay, now I want you to notice why she's single. Because <laughs> all he said was no. So I'm going to help you. In the women's world, they say shit and you have to make it up what it means. In a man's world, we actually say what we fucking mean. It's fucking crazy. If a guy, guys, are you with me? If a guy says to me, do you have lunch on Thursday? And I say, no, guys, what does it fucking mean? What does it mean? It just means no. It doesn't mean I'm not into you. It doesn't mean I'm of sex with someone else. It doesn't mean I'm gay. It just means no to fucking Thursday. How about Friday? <laughs> Give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. If it doesn't kill you, makes you so Give her a hand. Can you see how her story would get in the way of a strategy that would work? Yes or no? Can you see how his strategy, lack of understanding, would make women make up a story about him at times? Yes or no? So they all affect each other, don't they? But the glue that holds you in place is the story. If you want to grow a business, I can teach you a million strategies that will change you overnight. And if I get you to use a strategy and grow your business 30% like that, you are going to get so excited that your story about your business will change, won't it? You're like, I can rip this open. I'm going to make this thing 100% more profitable. That's why 80% of those people, I can grow them 30 to 130%. Because once I get into that momentum, people's story changes. And when their story changes, the third and most important thing changes, their state. Because that's what really changes it all. And that's why when I first came in the audience, I was listening to what you wanted, why I changed all my content today to give you what I delivered. Because I realized since you want so many different things to have a breakthrough, the most important one is state. Is social media number one for fundraising? From Al's to Movember, social media is changing the nonprofit world. Social media has become an increasingly important platform for charities and nonprofits. Not only does it expand the reach of the campaign itself, but it helps drive conversation and inspire action within various communities around the world. But not all fundraising campaigns seem to get it right. For everyone that skyrockets to success, there are thousands more that never seem to get off the ground. We've all heard of the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge for example, but what about the Doubtfire Face for Suicide Prevention campaign? in which supporters are asked to take a cream pie to the face as a tribute to Robin Williams' performance in the film Mrs. Doubtfire. Both campaigns were for a good cause, but one went viral, becoming a social phenomena, while the other flew under the radar. What makes the difference? Why are some fundraising campaigns more effective than others? It boils down to several factors. First and foremost, the mission must be worthwhile. It must resonate with the audience and be something that they can truly relate to, or at least understand. The campaign must also be original. Novelty scores a lot of points when it comes to mainstream culture. Social media is so saturated with copycats and imitations, that anything new and original is your best shot at capturing the audience's attention off the bat. The campaign will also have a better chance at going viral if it is highly customizable. By letting participants express themselves uniquely, and put their own personal spin on the message, a campaign will be able to engage the audience in a more intimate way as it essentially becomes a vehicle for personal expression. Of course, timing is important as well. There is always something to be said about celebrity involvement. It may seem like it takes the perfect storm for a social campaign to take off. And while that is rare, it's also very real. When a campaign gets it right, there's no telling where it will end. Here are four non-profit fundraising campaigns whose strategic use of social media helped them explode onto the scene. Al's Ice Bucket Challenge Last year, the Ice Bucket Challenge took over social media. 
from Facebook to Instagram to YouTube and Twitter, videos of people dousing themselves with buckets of ice water and challenging their friends to do the same dominated every feed and every channel. The social media powered video campaign was part of an online effort to raise awareness and money to fight against one of the most debilitating diseases in the world amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. The challenge entailed participants pouring a bucket of ice water over themselves while recording it, posting the video through a social media platform, then daring others to either do the same or donate $100 to the ALS Association. The timing of the challenge couldn't have been better, with the warm summer weather making it fun to participate. It was also easy for men, women and children of all ages and abilities to take the challenge with its simple rules, low cost and overall accessibility. But perhaps most importantly, the challenge provided a community that connected and rallied people around a good cause while still allowing each individual room for personal expression in how the challenge was completed. The fact that the challenge attracted a number of celebrities didn't hurt either. Martha Stewart, Mark Zuckerberg, Oprah, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Steven Spielberg and George W. Bush were just a few of the big names who participated in the challenge, helping make the challenge a philanthropic blockbuster. I've been challenged by uh, several Americans to uh, bring awareness to the ALS campaign. Woody Johnson, uh, our daughter Jenna Bush Hager, Coach Jim Harbaugh, and recently Roy McElroy. Now, to you all who challenged me, I do not think it's presidential uh, for me to be splashed with ice water, so I'm simply going to write you a check. Ow! <laughs> that check is for me. I don't want to ruin my hairstyle. Uh, now it's my privilege to challenge uh, my friend Bill Clinton. Uh, to the ALS challenge. Uh, yesterday was Bill's birthday and my gift to Bill is a bucket of cold water. Uh, for those of you interested in more information, please look up ALSA.org. In the end, more than 17 million videos were uploaded on social media platforms, and YouTube reported more than 1 billion related views. The viral campaign raised nearly $115 million for the ALS Association a 3,500% increase from the $2.8 million that the organization raised during the same time period last year. Live Strong Wristbands In 2004, it was hard to go anywhere without seeing someone donning a bright yellow wristband with the phrase Live Strong on it. The ubiquitous yellow bracelets associated with the Live Strong Foundation, formerly known as the Lance Armstrong Foundation, had become an international phenomenon, helping the organization raise nearly $100 million to provide support to those with cancer, and proving to be one of the most effective merchandising campaigns in history. The idea to use the silicone gel wristbands to raise awareness and funds for the fight against cancer actually started with Nike who had already been making them for basketball players as something fashionable yet safe to wear on the court. Nike approached the Live Strong Foundation and offered to make 5 million wristbands, emblazoned them with the words Live Strong. Nike also suggested the wristbands be made in yellow, the color of Lance Armstrong's jersey. The timing worked out perfectly. Armstrong wore the wristband throughout the 2004 Tour de France, where he became a six-time Tour champion and a number of Nike athletes sported them at the 2004 Olympic Summer Games in Athens, Greece. Then John Kerry, a prostate cancer survivor, wore one during the presidential campaign. The publicity couldn't have been greater, or more organic for that matter. Before long, the wristbands were being sold across all 50 states and in more than 60 countries. And in just one year, they had raised $50 million. During this time, Social media was also finding its way into mainstream culture, and the Live Strong Foundation began to leverage Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to propagate its message and reach a broader audience. Social media allowed Live Strong to keep the wristband momentum going strong. By providing cancer patients and survivors an online platform to tell their stories and find a new community, Live Strong was able to build an entirely new realm of relationships that enhanced the significance of the yellow wristbands even more. The wristbands, it seemed, were an easy way to show your affiliation with the organization. 
and the fact that they were inexpensive to make and buy meant that everyone men, women and children could afford to be part of the community. The wristbands also had a brand identity of their own, where people could use the wristbands in a social context to show others something about who they were and what they care about. They had become such a trend in mainstream culture, and particularly visible in social media, that other organizations eventually followed suit, and developed bracelets of their own with proceeds going to various causes. After the Lance Armstrong doping scandal, Nike parted ways with the Live S Strong organization, but what they had accomplished during their nine-year partnership was astounding. Together, Nike and Live S Strong helped raise more than $100 million and turned the organization's yellow wristband into an iconic symbol for the fight against cancer. The power of social media helped Live S Strong emerge as a global brand, providing the perfect platform to continue raising money, spreading awareness and making an impact well into the future. November Every November, things get a little fuzzier, as men across the world ditch their razors and grow mustaches to raise money and awareness for men's health issues specifically prostate and testicular cancer. The mustache madness is known as Movember, and since starting as a small, local fundraiser in Australia in 2004, it has grown into a global tradition and has raised nearly $600 million to fund 832 men's health programs in 21 countries. According to the Movember Foundation, Movember was born from recognition that a fun and engaging initiative could help encourage men to become more actively involved in their own health. Movember aims to increase awareness and support for men's health by getting conversations started at a grassroots level, educating men about the health risks they face, and raising vital funds for support programs. And it works, particularly due to social media. Since photographic evidence is half of the fun of Movember, Facebook, Instagram and even Twitter would be inundated with images of men and their bushy, wiry and sometimes patchy attempts at growing facial hair. This only helped accelerate the rate at which people learned about and decided to participate in the charitable campaign. Many cite the competition and camaraderie of Movember as the main reason they got involved. Some focus more on the message and the mission behind the campaign. Others do it simply because it's a trend. In fact, the trend has become so popular on social media that parody videos begin popping up, like this one by Nick Offerman who happily doles out his mustache growing advice. Hello. I'm classically trained actor and fine woodworker Nick Offerman. A few of you may know me as Ron Swanson from NBC's Parks and Recreation, but let's be honest, most of you know me for this. And this Movember, I'm here to instruct you on how to properly grow your very own. Developing my mustache required years of training. I brought it to Scotland, where sheep herders tamed its unruly I then ways. studied with Tibetan monks who combed it like a zen Every garden. day I washed it with cologne, whale oil, and beef And dried cologne. it over a campfire of peat and turf. And the bulk of you will end this month with something atrocious on your lip. The rest of you will be passable, but in the spirit of awareness, I wanted to offer a few simple ideas of my own that can help a novice grow a full and thicker mustache. Hammer and nail. Send a regular handwritten letter. Capture a household bug, then set it free. Tolerate a crying baby. Smell wood. Move out of your parents' house. Gain the trust of a dog. Sweat. Eat a raw onion. Eat a raw onion. And finally, and most importantly, don't shave your upper lip. So get ready for the single manliest journey of your life. And be sure to tell your friends, this mustache is a Movember mustache. So perhaps the takeaway here is to not be afraid to put a little fun and jest into fundraising. The cause may be serious, but the campaign doesn't have to be. The Movember movement works because it's fun, it's engaging, it's easy to do, and perhaps most importantly, it fits right into mainstream social media trends. No 8 Portraits In 2008, 
Proposition 8 was passed in the state of California, amending the Constitution to ban same-sex marriage. The proposition sparked a wave of protest and initiative within the LGBT community, with a number of new political and protest groups rallying together in opposition of what many deemed a violation of civil rights. One of the most prominent campaigns to come out of this groundswell was the NOH8 campaign. The NOH8 campaign was a photographic silent protest created by celebrity photographer Adam Buska and his partner Jeff Parsley. The photographs featured subjects with NOH8 painted on one cheek and duct tape covering their mouths, symbolizing their voice being silenced away by Prop 8, or Prop H8 as it came to be called. At first, it was just everyday people of all ages and races who posed for the photographs. But it wasn't long before the images flooded social media, becoming a trend that many were eager to adopt. Some photographers and student organizations even began setting up their own photo shoots replicating the NOH8 shots. The campaign really gained traction when a number of celebrities began participating in the photo shoots. Larry King, Megan MC Kane, Idina Menzel, the Kardashians, and Dr. Drew were just a handful of public personalities who shared their NOH8 photos via their social media platforms, drawing more attention to the cause and ultimately, helping in the campaign grow from a local California effort against Prop 8 to a national movement. Even though Proposition 8 was eventually ruled unconstitutional by a federal court in 2010, the NOH8 campaign has continued to expand. Most recently, the NOH8 campaign has shifted its mission to stand against discrimination and bullying of all kinds. The message of no hate can be interpreted and applied broadly, and speaks to each person in their own way. Thanks for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed and tell me what you think in the comments. Click subscribe channel. Because I post new videos every days. Usually. Thanks.